Hello and welcome to Going to College, a special education podcast brought to you in association with QQI. I'm Rob O'Hanrahan and this two-part series is bringing you through the Leaving Cert results, the trends, the issues and most importantly, what happens next. And today we're looking at starting life when third level kicks in. So in episode two, I'm delighted to be joined by QQI CEO Porig Walsh and Roisin O'Donoghue, guidance counsellor at Belvedere College. Roisin, I'll start with you. This is a huge moment for, for the more than 60,000 who got their Leaving Cert results and those who applied as mature students and everyone else in between. What were your own memories, I suppose, of leaving secondary school? Yeah, it, it is a pivotal moment. It's it's a moment of real transition where you're kind of leaving the safety bubble of your, your second level school, um, a place that you've you've known and lived every day for the last six years of your life, five or six years. Um, I remember it being a time of great excitement, but also um, trepidation as well. You know, I was nervous about going off to college. Um, My friends were all going different places. We were, you know, the group was breaking up, the gang was breaking up. Um, But I remember being very excited about the the new chapter, the level of independence it was going to bring, um, moving out of home at the time. Um, So it was a... I remember being nervous, but being really uh, excited about what was what was coming, you know, the mm. next chapter. Um, and it's a time full of possibility. I remember feeling that as well, you know, very, uh, very open to all of the new experiences I was about to have. And particularly, I suppose, Porig, coming off the back of what is a very, very intense year. And this will have been a very, very intense couple of weeks between the results themselves, the CAO offers, but your own memories, I suppose, of, of leaving secondary school. Well, it was 100 years ago. <laughs> it was back in uh, 1977. Back then, the only, only way of getting your Leaving Cert results was by going down to the school mm-hmm. along with your friends. That's changed. Uh, this year, people can log in through the portal and, and be happy or, or, or disappointed uh, in private if they, uh, if they want. But there was, I mean, it's a fan de siècle moment. It's an end. Mm-hmm. It's an end. Mm-hmm. Particularly, I went to a boys' secondary school, so the idea of going to college was going out into the real world. I had an elder sister who'd, who had done her leaving the year before, so I had an idea of what it, what it was going to be like. But it's still, it's a huge change mm. for people, hugely exciting time and a, your chance to become an adult. You know, it's, it, it's, it's still that. It was it's still yeah. that. It always was that as well. I have a very vivid memory in about six months before we sat our leaving cert of a teacher telling us that what we would really, really struggle with was when the timetable was taken away from us. So, and what he meant was, was that you rocked into school at the same time every morning. You probably saw the same people and then went to them in class and then there was a break and there was a lunch Mm. and they were always the same time every day. And I remember kind of thinking that that wasn't going to be a big deal, but it is when that kind of safety net is taken away from your routine. It's a huge change. Absolutely. I mean, suddenly you are responsible for managing your own time Mm -hmm. um, in a way that you really weren't in school. You know, as you said, the timetable is so structured in a school environment. Um, And, you know, moving into depending on what what you go on to do, what kind of course you decide to do, um, you might have a timetable ranging from 10 hours to 40 hours a week. And it's how you manage your time in between those sessions um, suddenly becomes your sole responsibility. Responsibility. And that's a big change. Mm. You know, that is a big change for, for uh, a young person to manage. So reading time in the library is not necessarily a chance to go to the student bar. <laughs> exactly. That yeah. Exactly. That's what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the other difference is that because the system is semesterized in most cases now, people have exams either before Christmas or mm. just after Christmas. So you start in September and you're into exams early enough. So really, people have to <laughs> knuckle down early on. I mean, it used to be that you didn't do exams till the following summer. So it is important Mm -hmm. at at a time of big transition for people that they do get down uh, to doing it because unlike, say, the Leaving Cert, where you only sit the one exam at the end, there are tests all the way Mm -hmm. through college. You could have uh, exams, short exams, quizzes, things like that at various stages. That's good in a way because it takes some of the pressure off, but it does mean that people have to become engaged from the start. Yeah, and I suppose, Roisin, managing that, we hear a lot about continuous assessment in secondary Mm. schools and we know that things have changed at the junior cert and somewhat with the leaving cert. But there is a lot of that now and students have to get used to the fact that they will have multiple essays due often at the same time from different lecturers. It it is quite quite a change in that regard. And that, that, I suppose, those essays 
won't result in a letter home to your parents if you don't do mm-hmm. them or if you don't hit the standard that it will affect your grade. Exactly. I mean, that's the, the point I was making about the personal responsibility, um, especially if you're moving away from home and, and, and you're now managing your own time. There's nobody there getting you up in the morning, making sure that you're at your first lecture, um, you know, that taking attendance the way it happened in secondary school. That's all changed. Um, But most courses, most colleges will issue a a handbook at the start of the year. And it's just really important to take that on board, mark in the key dates of the assessments, the assignments. um, And there are, you know, academic support offices and student services offices available for students if they feel they need a little bit of help or, or, you know, um, coaching with that. Yeah. Um, To take a look, I suppose... We've maybe jumped the gun slightly in that we're already in college, we're already in the university. But take a look, I suppose, at the process of the CAO for a second porig. So there is a somewhat, it can be an element of a confusion around this, that people will get a first round offer and then potentially a second or third round offer. So the first round offers we'll take a look at, first of all. What will that look like for people and what, are they, what do they need to do with them? Can I pass that to, can, of to course, the guidance yeah, counselor yeah. to be more used to that? Absolutely. So... Um, Yes, so the first round offers will be issued Wednesday of of next week. Um, And uh, so uh, a student uh, will may or may not be happy with their first round offer. Um, But the advice that we would usually give is to accept your first round offer and wait to see if something arises in round two or round three. Um, So you never have the opportunity to move down through your CAO uh, to a lower offer, a lower preference offer. But you do have the opportunity if a place arises in round two or round three to accept a higher preference on your CAO list. Um, But there's no guarantee if you don't accept your first offer that there will be an offer in round two or round three. So the advice we would usually give is to accept that first round offer um, and and wait to see what happens in in round two or round three. So just, just to recap for anyone who might be a little bit unsure, let's say I get my third or fourth choice in the CAO that comes through my round one offer Mm. I really really want my first or second choice but by selecting the the offer that I get my round one and accepting that I am not ruling out the possibility that I can still get my option one or option two it just mightn't come through Absolutely. So, you know, if if for um, any specific reason the places aren't taken up by um, other students that were offered the, the place in round one or round two, those places become available uh, in round two. Um, so you're not ruling yourself out of that. But as you said yourself, the, the um, place may not uh, arise in round two. Poor, we mentioned this a little bit uh, in the first episode of this podcast. We talked about the idea of some students will be hellbent on a certain area of study or even a particular course and if that doesn't arise for them and if this wasn't their year for example there are still other pathways available to them might be worthwhile for us to maybe have a quick chat about them so for if there is a student maybe whose round one offer or even round two or three offer has not brought up what they want there are still other options available to them <coughs> yeah i mean there are other options people can obviously go back and do the leaving cert again they can also uh, do a plc program usually for a year that will give them an opportunity of getting in the following year. It won't get them in that year, but those applications, uh, you don't have to apply in advance to do those. They can, they can apply in most cases up to September until the course are filled. And on many of the courses, including the high points courses, there are a certain number of places set aside within that. Just for instance, in UCD, if you want to do science, there are 20 places every year set aside for QQIFET. Uh, graduates so it is possible going through that route to get in but it will be for next year in that in, in that particular case okay so those options are available but for those who are packing their bags and heading out the door and particularly for those who are moving out of home roaching it's a very challenging landscape i think everyone is aware of the housing mm. crisis in this country but it is particularly affecting students however there are options available to students when it co- when it comes to accommodation yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. The accommodation crisis, we're all very aware of it. It's its its in the news all of the time at the moment. But um, 
I would advise students to directly contact their college or their university um, and ask for support. So most colleges and universities would have an accommodations office that will be able to direct students in terms of the best way to try and secure accommodation. Um, most colleges reserve on-campus accommodation for their first year students and then will also help them identify um, digs in the local area, places to rent in the local area. I think it's also interesting as well to look at the um, regional options that are really coming online lately for third level students mm-hmm. um, places like MTU and the Atlantic Technological University have opened up that university option for students beyond say the capital city or Cork or, or Galway um, and it means that um, the accommodation may be more available uh, regionally as well for them yeah I think Pori Roshin touched on a few of those areas that are available, so be that the certain percentage of accommodation, on campus accommodation that will be reserved. There's also, I think, facilities such as Student Pad where, where students can link in with local residents and rent a digs room. So there are options available, but it is still having a huge impact on students. No, it, <coughs> it does, and it means in many cases that students have to commute, which is, mm. which is not ideal. It means in some cases that students can take up an offer of a place because they simply can't get mm. the accommodation. It's obviously a challenge as well for someone who has applied to do, say, medicine and has applied to Cork, Galway and Dublin, mm. and that the chances, if they get a different option in the second or third round of CAO, they're effectively looking at a different city to go to. <clears throat> I mean, there are challenges, obviously, in first year in terms of that, but I think people have to remember that you don't have to be stuck where you were or what you were doing mm. in first year. Once you've done a year of college, you'll get to know more people. It becomes a bigger option to be able to rent a house, for instance, between three or four friends. So, you know, even if it doesn't appear ideal in the first year, down the line, things can, can, can pick up uh, quite a lot and you can get the, the genuine college experience. And actually, that, from that. that genuine college experience is a really interesting one because we've had, I suppose, 2023 has been probably the most normal year that a lot of students have had in the last few years. And we think of the COVID restrictions and campuses of effectively being shut down for as long as they were. There's so much to be excited about when it comes to going to third level Roshan clubs, societies and everything else. There's a whole Absolutely. new world opening up for these students. Absolutely. I mean, it's just so great to see college campuses opening up and in full swing and full of life and thriving again. Um, I mean, I have great memories of Freshers Week, my first week in college. So there will be lots of activities to engage with in your, your first couple of months in college. And um, I really would advise students to get stuck in and, and sample college life. But clubs and societies are as much a part of college life as the academic lectures are. Um, it's where you, you meet your friends. It's where you gain your social circle. It's where you find your tribe. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of exploration that should happen in first year that sets you up then for the rest of your, your college experience. Um, yeah, and probably worth saying as well, Porig, that, I mean, yeah, you have your maybe traditional clubs and societies like you probably have a soccer team a Gaelic football team a hurling team and everyone else in between but from I remember there was a home and away society there was a pogo society there's quite a lot for people to do here there's kind of an interest for everyone there there is and there's a chance to do things that you wouldn't have done before that might have been more difficult for instance you know to do something like mountaineering or climbing mm-hmm. requires a lot of gear that you mightn't have had but in college they were things that we did we went and and did uh, youth hostelling uh, hiking things like that, like that which were a great way uh, to meet people, as, as, as Roisin said, it, like that part of the experience is, is as important as the mm. academic experience. Yeah, and I think as well, like the the best place to find out about these is obviously on campus as well. But the student union social media pages, the college itself, their social media pages. There's a lot of information, I suppose, that that students are going to have to take in in these next few weeks, Roisin. Yes, and actually, social media is a great way to to engage with what what's happening on campus. I've seen um, student takeovers of uh, different college social media platforms, which gives a really good insight into that genuine student experience. Um, so, uh, th- and you mentioned the student union um, office there. That's a great place to go um, to find out what's going on and maybe even to get involved in your student union. Mm-hmm. You might want to run as a rep or or put yourself forward, but that gets you right into the heart of college life, into the thick of it. And, you know, I'm just picking up on something you said earlier about this, there being a club or society for everyone absolutely any niche you can think of there will be a society and if there isn't you have the opportunity to start one yourself and like I said find your tribe or build your tribe yeah and I think that's that's a really interesting one as well because so much of the college experience 
Porg is actually being there on campus yeah. and experiencing these things. Yeah, and I think the, the thing we have to remember is there have been huge investments over the last number of years on campuses, mm-hmm. including in the, the new technological uh, universities uh, that are there. there are, I mean, I visit these as, uh, as part of my job in QQI, and I'm just amazed by just the quality of, of the campus. That they're, the other thing that, that the university have to remember now is you have to give re- students a reason to come in now because mm. it is possible and was possible to do stuff from home. So the offering has to be has to be there. It has to be something valuable to get people in. Just on the clubs and societies part as well. The thing to remember is they are run by students. Mm. They are run by people who are, who are in the, you know, uh, for, for the, they're not run. It's not an external body that's doing this. Mm. I mean, so you're, you're meeting another set of young people as well to get involved with that. And as... Uh, Roisin was saying as well on the student the students union side you can obviously you know become president of the students union or be a sabbatical officer but there are lots of chances to represent being a class representative mm. uh, for instance you can get a, get involved in the the, the program board uh, into, students are involved an awful lot more in the education uh, system in college than before lots of people can get uh, can get involved there's actually was a word you used earlier Roisin I think is really really I suppose <coughs> key is that's ownership because mm. that's about everything really now when you move into college, whether it's about your, your academic achievements, whether it's about what you decide to do outside of the classroom. Mm. That's what this is now. It's a real ownership of your own kind of path. Absolutely. I think for the first time, you were really empowered to shape your own experience. You know, we, we always encourage students to get involved in second level school and in the, the extracurricular activities that are happening. But to a certain extent, that that a route through school is very much mapped out for you. But when you get to third level, um, you have that opportunity to take ownership of your own experiences, um, what you get involved in, how much you step out of your comfort zone. Um, you know, you, you really have so many opportunities available to you. Yeah. I mean, the other thing, I mean, there are many programs have internships, for instance, which allow people to take uh, take a year out and work for a year. So normally after the end of the second year, there's a fantastic opportunities through the Erasmus mm-hmm. uh, program that was purely a European program where students could go uh, for a semester to as part of their uh, of their uh, their college experience. But there's that's now opened up worldwide. People can travel mm-hmm. all over the world as uh, as part as part of that experience. And of course, all of those are reciprocal arrangements, which means the colleges will have students from overseas, and that makes for a much more international e- experience as well for Irish students. Absolutely, and I suppose it's a huge way in in the manner in which you learn. I think in third level as well, like because of that kind of independent led study, and that can lead itself to and it has in recent months we've heard quite a lot about the rise of artificial intelligence and if you listen to one side of the argument chat gpt is going to single-handedly destroy education if you listen to the other extreme of the argument this is the best thing to ever happen to mankind ever so as always it's probably somewhere in the middle and um, porg but it is something that universities are going to have to come to terms with and students i suppose will have to adapt to it I mean, the end of the residential campus experience has been predicted for <laughs> 50 years and it's still there. It's still there. It's there because people still want to, uh, want, want to, want to meet people. It, mm. It's important to remember that we have seen changes in technology all along. So, for instance, the, when spell checkers came out first, people said, oh, people will forget how to spell. In my experience, a spell checker actually improves your spelling because it sees the mistakes that you've made. AI has been around for lots of what we do. And anytime you Google search, you will find a whole series of prompts that come back. You also may want to. Other people have asked. They're all, that's all the use of artificial intelligence to work out uh, about what's been, what's been done there. AI, if, if embraced, uh, I think will allow allow certain things uh, t- uh, to be done that will help uh, and assist. The danger is that you pass off someone else's work as yours. There was cheating for years, people getting essays to be written by, by people. That can now be done by, by chat uh, GPT and other generative, generative AI systems. But it's important to remember that all, all AI has is what's already out there. And in many cases, what they can't do, one of the most important things they can't do is they don't uh, find references properly. That's one of the first things that you, you work when you They will make up references and, and cite things. And there are techniques, the same techniques that are used by Turnitin for plagiarism and some things that can look at detecting AI. So I think people have to embrace AI. They have to learn about it. Uh, QQI is involved in the establishment of the National Academic Integrity Network, which provides advice to colleges. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, we, we have people from 
from. Uh, students are involved in, in that process as well. And what's really important is to be able to explain to people what AI is, but also how and when it can be used mm -hmm. and that if you do try and use it and pass off as your own work, the likelihood is that you will get caught. And if you get penalised in college, you, you can get kicked out, you can get mm -hmm. expelled, you can lose your, your credit for a particular programme. So whereas I don't think we should run away from it, it's important that people can embrace it and be, be knowledge, become knowledgeable about it. I'm thinking it. Of, um, of correcting junior cert English essays and a routine mistake that was made in Roche. I don't know if you came across this before as well, where there was a certain junior cert novel, um, very, very popular. However, by the time students got to it and tried to remember the title, it had become a handbook. So it was now How to Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> uh, and I just don't think that ChatGPT can replicate that. And it probably makes us think as well, Roisin, that yes, ChatGPT can do many things. And yes, AI and these generative systems can do quite a lot. But replacing creativity and human grade creativity, and particularly in third level where it becomes so important, is very difficult to do. Absolutely. And I think a lot of the richness of the learning experience comes from that relational aspect of sitting down and having a discussion in a tutorial group uh, that you might do at college. Mm -hmm. um, you know, AI is not going anywhere. It's here to stay. But I don't think it can replace that relational aspect of learning that becomes very important at higher level. The creativity, the relationality, um, that's, that's what's key when you're sitting down in college and having discussions mm -hmm. um, ab about, you know, uh, whatever it is that you're studying, um, that can't be replaced by AI. Okay, so the robots aren't coming for us just yet. <laughs> just finally, before we finish up, I suppose, like we talked quite a lot about the transition, we talked about our own experiences, I suppose, going back uh, and looking at when we, we all left secondary school to go into college, but um, Porg, I might start with you. What, what would you tell your younger self if you were going to, to college again in, for the first time in a few weeks? I mean, I embrace it for what it is. I mean, the, you, people say, you know, your college days are the best days as a trite statement. It really was a fantastic opportunity for me. But one of the things that you get is, and, and when someone asked me what the best part of college was, and I said it was like three summers off. I spent one of those in working in Copenhagen. I spent one of them working in Chicago. And you take back those things and that learning when you come back and, and, and mature as you as you find uh, find your way through. I mean, it, you can't get it back. You can't get back those, those those four years. So really embrace them for what they are and take all the opportunities that you can. And Roshan, I suppose, same question to you. I'd echo a lot of that. You know, embrace every opportunity that comes your way and don't be afraid to push yourself outside of your comfort zone, as uh, scary as it might feel. But the other piece of advice that I, I would probably give myself is just acknowledging that it can be daunting moving from an environment you know so well into the unknown and there are times when you will need to ask for help and there are times that you may struggle you know it's 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 a wonderful time but it's not all roses so if you do find yourself struggling academically or with your mental health or with your physical health reach out and ask uh, for help there are loads of services available on campuses and um, there's careers office uh, student support offices academic supports mental health supports they're available and use of use them. Um, it'll only enhance your experience to ask for help early if you need it. Yeah, it's a very important note, I think, mm. to finish on as well. So my thanks to both Roisin and to Porig as well. This has been the second episode of a two-part series in association with QQI. A reminder to go back and listen to episode one for all the further details on the Leaving Cert results and CAO as well. Thank you very much.